I'm Tiffany Seeley, a software developer from the University of Sussex. Um, so, yep, so I guess, lastly, I am an activist for women in technology, um, trying to kind of bridge the, the gender gap within technology in general and get women encouraged and really inspired to enter technology and learn programming and, and go through all of the things. Um, so my specialization is natural language processing. Um, so maybe some of you guys have heard about it. Basically, it's, um, it's a subset of machine learning. It's a subset of AI that uses text as data and it processes the data to kind of um, infer some meaningful things about the text. Um, so one thing that we do is to kind of mine through text data, um, accumulate late text data, and, um, whichever kind of um, open source resources we can find, and then do some software development on it so that we can share that code and make it more easier for um, people within the software development environment to, to do as well. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about the job hunt. Um, so I think a lot of us living within this pandemic season, we I, are either looking for jobs, we are trying to keep our jobs, or maybe we're just um, interested in switching fields. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is how we can kind of leverage AI to facilitate this process of finding a job, or at least just getting an insider scoop on maybe how businesses are using um, recruitment data, um, sort of like job employment data. And the next thing is basically bias within data, what it looks like, where is it coming from? And I'll introduce a few um, um, websites to look at for that. So the first thing um, I wanted to kind of wrap your head around is the concept of learning with artificial intelligence. So the idea is that you would have a computer um, that processes information and um, recalls information over time. And similarly, you would have a human doing the same thing. So I like to kind of think of it as um, You've got machine learning doing some algorithms, which are basically repetitive things. And humans kind of do repetitive things as well. And then at the end, you have this goal of recalling that information. So I like to think about it as like, um, if you move to a new city for the first time and you're trying to find out which supermarket is the closest to you, um, you might want to do some market research. You might want to figure out which supermarkets are around, um, collect some data on the, the proximities to you. And in the end, you can, you can infer that some supermarket would be closer um, than others. And so that would be the kind of learning process. So um, we go through this process with machine learning where it's, um, it's actually very similar to how students learn. So at the bottom here, you've got a picture of pupils, students within a classroom, um, very similar to probably how you grew up in classrooms, taking these exams um, with your other classmates and they're all times. And, and so basically humans um, are taught within a classroom and we're given a lot of material. And within that material, the, the goal is to kind of recall and test ourselves um, after gathering that material, learning that material, and, um, and, and sort of seeing how much we can recall from what we've learned. Machines are working in the same way. So basically at the top, we have here a massive data set and this data set can be anything. So let's say that you're trying to learn, um, let's just take it back to like elementary, like you're trying to learn how to differentiate a character versus a number. Um, pretty straightforward, pretty simple. Uh, for a computer, it's a little difficult, but the idea is that we would give 
the computer a massive amount of characters or numbers. And we would have, um, you know, we would tell the computer the correct choice. And pretty soon we would think that the computer would um, kind of store like distinctive characteristics about a character and distinctive characteristics about a number. So that eventually when we test the computer on, we like to say it's unseen data, kind of testing data that they haven't seen before, then the, the computer would give us the right characterization. So, um, you know, very similar to humans in that way. So this is kind of how machines and humans are learning in the same ways. We go through this process of training and testing. So um, I was kind of inspired to do this talk today because I had talked with my um, friend who recently told me she wanted to enter SEO, which is a subset of web development. And to be fair, I don't have much knowledge of SEO. And um, because I'm in tech, you know, she asked me, you know, you know, what do you think are the right skills to get into SEO? And I, I told her that I, I actually wasn't sure, um, but that the best thing she could do to start to pivot her, um, her current job to more of an SEO, which is like a web development um, skill. And um, she comes from a music background, she's a musician. So kind of bridging the gap from music to SEO um, someone like me coming from artificial intelligence, I have no, you know, sort of, I, I have no knowledge of SEO. And I told her the best thing she could do is just look at her CV and figure out what are the keywords on your CV and are they descriptive of SEO or are they more descriptive of music? So the idea is that, um, I kind of use this example of AI with her and I thought it would be good to introduce it to you guys today because um, it may help you in some ways if you're trying to look for a job, just to know a little bit about what AI processing is, know a little bit about how businesses are automating their processes so that they can read through a lot of CVs quickly and determine the best candidate. So we'll talk a bit about this and then we'll also dive into some criticism and if you're starting to think about, you know, what kind of biases or assumptions are out there when it comes to looking through massive amounts of data, um, definitely, you know, put your question or comment into the chat and we can have a chat about it afterwards. Um, so what we have here on the screen is a, a sentence, the cat sat on the mat. It's a very simple sentence. Um, you know, definitely not gonna put that on your CV. Um, but I wanted to just uh, give you an idea of how a computer would process this sentence. So we use this word called keyword extraction. And it basically says that we'll take a sentence and we'll do something called tokenization, which is to break down the sentence into smaller, um, well, break down the sentence into words, but not just words, we're also interested in punctuation. So the period at the end is a punctuation and it becomes this kind of token and the words also become a kind of token. And then the next thing we kind of do is lowercase everything because um, we know computers suffer from um, some case sensitivity and that um, V with the capitalized T is not the same as the with the, um, a lowercase t. So we like to kind of lowercase everything. So um, this sort of idea of having um, an abbreviation or an acronym of some sort um, is not really helpful for a computer. Um, and the other thing we do, and I, I won't dive into it now on the call because we probably don't have enough time for it, but if you're interested, definitely send me a note we do some additional processes that basically make the sentence into cat sat mat. 
And we could do further analysis. We could take out sat because it's a verb and just kind of keep the nouns. Um, but the computer is doing this and it's not doing this without some sort of learning process. There are a lot of machine learning models that we use and leverage to break down sentences into tokens. And one of them is kind of um, very much on an English corpus level. Um, um, the models assume a lot of the um, grammatical and sh like architecture of an English sentence. And it would output to you, um, you know, uh, words or, you know, like broken up um, fragments of your sentence that are helpful from an English perspective. So there's definitely a language component involved as well. Um, so the next thing is that we make these assumptions all the time. So like we can assume that um, cat sat mat would be helpful in identifying a keyword, but it doesn't, um, it kind of breaks up a lot of the assumptions that a human would have. So when we talk about assumptions, one thing that we can say is that word order doesn't matter. Um, the fact that we had cat sat mat means nothing to a computer. We kind of just lose the order completely. Quantities, they don't matter at all. And hot topics, they pretty much matter a lot. Um, so this is obviously very much centered to a specific type of model. Not all models are the same, but a very simplistic model would take order out of it, would take quantity out of it, uh, would lowercase everything. It doesn't care about nouns, verbs, or anything. It just kind of cares about the hot topics, really. And in that, it cares about the frequencies of those hot topics. So we like to think it's, um, we like to think of the words as a bag and that we put all of the words into this bag and that no longer do you have order of precedence. Um, but what you do have is just kind of the frequencies of which cat, mat, and sat appear within multiple amounts of text documents. So I hope that kind of helps you envision um, a, um, like processing text from a machine learning perspective. I wanted to show you a bit of work that I'm doing at the moment with um, topic extraction using this thing called a naive Bayes classifier. Um, so if you're not familiar with topic extraction or naive Bayes in general, don't worry, that's fine. I just want to illustrate a quick example for those of you who do have more experience with AI machine learning um, and what we're kind of working on at the moment, but also how you can maybe benefit from knowing this um, as well. So I trained a machine learning model very quickly. Um, and this I'm doing this as a part of my dissertation, uh, but on a larger scale. But essentially, for this example of my friend who comes from a music background, and she wants to not enter AI, but she wants to enter kind of a tech field. Um, I took, um, not sure if anyone's um, of, of familiar with it, but I took data. So a lot, when I say data, I mean like a lot of text documents. And those text documents in particular are abstracts from scientific publications. So if you're familiar with it, there's this publication database called Web of Science. And it's really good in the way of being able to export a lot of data. So I trained a machine learning model on data specifically related to music and then data specifically related to computer science, artificial intelligence. And it turns out the, the model did really well. Um, and I think this is because, and you're probably thinking it too, that they're very easily distinguishable entities, right? So music is pretty different from AI in some way. Um, and so these are kind of sample sentences we have. You can kind of see that um, 
we have some key words that would definitely appear in computer science that would not appear in music. But the idea is that what we do is we, we get the frequencies of the topics that occur within a body of text. And, um, and so this is where it's helpful to know that frequency matters. The, the amount of times that you put on your CV that you have um, worked on software, if you're going into software development, it actually matters. It matters the amount of times that you say software. It matters the amount of time that you say development. And the, the key words that you think are very descriptive of a particular field of study or field of employment, my kind of advice is to just learn the keywords of that um, specific field and customize your CV in that way. So I think that is kind of um, a good way to, to, to reorder your CV a bit. Um, so this other thing, in case you're an expert out there, we use term frequencies and inverse document frequencies. Um, so again, on the topic of frequencies, it matters the amount of times that you say um, cats in your, in your sentence, if you're looking for sentences that um, are descriptive of cats. So um, similarly for your field of employment, it kind of matters the skills that you put onto paper, um, not so much paper these days into virtual format because businesses are using that virtual format to kind of process automatically and to figure out um, distinguishable um, categories for those documents. So I guess um, to kind of sum that up, AI is definitely becoming um, a standard tool for businesses. Um, we're knowing more about the machine learning process than we ever have. Um, I think it's good to know a bit about it um, in case you're not interested at all, that's totally fine. But I think it's good to know AI at the top level because it's going to be all around us and people are interested in automating things that are very repetitive. And this is where AI comes into uh, the picture. Um, and so I wanted to, hold on. I wanted to then bring your, eye, your, your mind to a place of bias. So when we use automation, we can think sometimes it's, it's gold, you know, data is gold. Um, but I think it's really important to understand that data is coming from a specific place. They're, they're coming from places that have harvested a lot of data. And in ways that data could be highly biased. So if, we, if the goal is to train a machine learning by, um, uh, model on data, a lot of data that's just you know, freely available, then we have to kind of question where it's coming from, one. And then also, is there massive bias within this data? So the, um, what I wanted to kind of show you right now is if you're on a computer or if you have access to a web browser, go ahead and type into your browser, thispersondoesnotexist.com. Um, so go ahead and type that into your browser and then just click refresh. So this is an example of a generative adversarial network. It's a um, type of neural network we use within artificial intelligence. Um, and what it does is it basically creates fake images. Of, well, sorry, this particular GAN um, for this person does not exist.com um, creates fake images of people. So all of the images that you see there are people that don't exist but they were created based off of a lot of training data. So the computer had so much data, it was able to create um, a human face. Um, so that's why if you see like 
in the background of some of these images, they're very distorted. Um, and some of them are kind of odd, to be fair. Um, so it raises some ethical questions that um, I think we have to ask ourselves when it comes to relying on machine learning models to do um, automated processes for us. Um, one, how many people of color did you see? Um, was there a fair balance of gender? And if you know, if you can ask these questions to your team and to the company that you work for, um, it's a good conversation to open up. Um, obviously, we're we're very much subjected to data that's freely accessible, and it's not so time efficient or even um, economically efficient to generate a lot of data, um, just, you know, you know, without any sort of incentive. So a lot of times we rely on free data and they could have massive biases in them. So um, I just wanted to kind of end on that a little bit. And um, the last thing I wanted to dive into is that if you're a woman, or if you know of a woman who's trying to get into tech, um, one, one organization I work with, Code First Girls, um, does an amazing job at kind of really preparing women to program, to understand programmatic thought, and to just kind of test out something to make it work. Um, because, Technology is definitely in the forefront of all of our lives. Um, and it's important that we have a gender equality within our businesses as we go forward. And it's important to kind of have conversations about biases and data and um, be skeptical of data. But it's, I think it's also a really imaginative field. I think it's a beautiful field to get into in that machine learning and AI in general is not the kind of terminator figure that we all maybe once thought of it as. It's actually just growing every day. And um, yeah, so that's where I wanted to leave you. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that if you are a business or if you um, know of a business or if you yourself are someone who wants to enter into um, programming, Python in particular, um, then definitely check out Code First Girls. Um, they, they take sponsorships from businesses and I know they have a lot of partnerships at the moment with some pretty big companies um, just as a way to incentivize more women to, to learn coding. And that's it.